Brian Smith here, and welcome to the Dream Path Podcast, where I try to get inside the heads of talented creatives from all over the world. My goal is to demystify and humanize the creative process and make it accessible to everyone. Now let's jump in. All right, we're here for the uh, recap of last week's episode. With uh, Tracy Rector. Good to see you, man. Good to see you. So um, we're going to start off the show uh, a little differently. We have some reviews to share and uh, wanted to just thank the listeners for taking the time to leave a review online. Absolutely. Yeah, you can do that on iTunes, Spotify, wherever you listen to podcasts, there's usually a way to leave a review. And uh, there's two ways to do it. You can just leave the number of stars you think it deserves, five out of five, whatever it may be, four out of five. You can also leave a written review. So there's quite a few star reviews and several written reviews that are pretty badass. And I just wanted to read those online. Nice. So, so this is a review from Kaylee May. It says, great man, love his work. Now, I don't know if they're talking about the guest <laughs> or they're talking about me, but I'm just going to assume it's me <laughs> right now. Great man, love his work. <laughs> yeah. Um, again, another review from Baden, uh, left on November 16th. It says, uh, great work. We could be the guest. It could be me, but whatever. <laughs> it's it's all pretty vague. <laughs> Thank you for, for that review. Here's a review from Chad Elliott. Well done. Uh, Brian asks great questions and gives his guest space to answer. He's a great listener. The guests tell excellent stories and share useful insights. Thanks, Chad. Right on, Chad. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, another review, amazing, my favorite podcast to listen to. Um, and then here's a review from Gerald Johnson, who is actually a guest on our show. Oh, wow. Yeah. So he, he left us a review back in July. I haven't mentioned it until now. Uh, five stars. It says, grunt with attitude. <laughs> I don't know if that's him or, or me. I think it's, <laughs> it's uh, ambiguous. It says, Brian's Dream Path podcast is easy on the ears, informative, in-depth, and refreshing. His easy banter with guests allows the artist to spin their origin tales and creative processes freely, but with well-defined goals. Dream Path gives us front row seats as Brian and the artist turn page after page of their evolution and progression. Thanks, Brian, and thanks to the artists who flow through this podcast waters. Well done. So that's, I think, the, my favorite review. That's a good one. And if anybody is just tuning in and they don't know what, who Gerald Johnson is, he's the uh, bass player for Steve Miller Band. Right. Yeah. Yeah. He's on I the mean, Joker album. He was on, uh, I think, all the albums before that. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's legendary. Uh, one more review. I'm not going to read them all. Uh, it says, uh, my wife and I listened to the first episode of this podcast on a long drive across the state. The idea for the podcast is unique and fascinating and the topic is important. The vision for this podcast is clearly articulated, and Brian really follows through. He lets the interview unfold naturally and nudge the conversation in just the right direction with careful and genuinely thoughtful questions. His guest was fantastic, engaging, welcoming, and with a fascinating story to tell. The whole episode kept us glued to the speakers. We are looking forward to seeing what you produce in the future. So um, those are a few reviews from iTunes. I haven't checked out Spotify reviews recently, but the reason I'm doing that is uh, not to brag, but instead to tell the listeners how much I appreciate feedback. And even, mm -hmm. even if the feedback is negative, call me on my cell phone, text me. My number is, I think, on the website mm -hmm. or you can email me and just let us know what you think. Right. You know, the talk about show length. You can talk about the types of guests we're having on, make guest suggestions. Uh, this is a, a fairly new project. We started in late March of 2019, and uh, we're coming up, up on a year now. In a few months, we'll be at the year mark, the year anniversary. And so um, there is definitely room to reformat and shape the show and make it even better than it is. I agree. And we're open to that. Absolutely. Yeah. So let's talk about uh, Tracy Rector and what we learned from her. She's a cool lady, huh? Yeah, yeah. I can I, just tell. She's a, just a really cool, cool lady, and she's got a lot of stuff to say. And I love that she's working with getting these stories of the indigenous people out 
out out in the air to for everybody to learn from. I think there's a lot of things we need to learn about what's happened to the indigenous people of not only the state, the entire country. Right. Yeah, it's um it's pretty cool to see a filmmaker who is so dedicated to storytelling in its purest form without commercialization really tainting the process and not even being concerned about the money part of it. You know, she's just she just cares about telling a good story and making sure it gets out there. Yeah. And um you know, you hear a, a, I think most people that think about visual storytellers like Tracy they think about, well, they're aspiring to go to Hollywood. Right. You know, that's where they eventually want to be. And I really didn't get that sense from Tracy. And, and that's um, pretty admirable because you know that she's finding value in telling stories that may not have wide box office appeal. Right. But they're so important that they need to be told. Mm-hmm. And she's willing to play that role. And uh, I felt a little bit, uh, as I was listening to the episode, I felt a little bit like um, maybe I talked too much <laughs> during, during the episode, but I was, I was so enthusiastic and excited to talk to her about Dawnland mm-hmm. and all of the work that she's done in the 400 films that she's made yeah, that's in her amazing. career. I mean, I, she, I think she's about my age and she's made 400 movies. That's 400 more than I've made. <laughs> it's pretty incredible. So, um, neat person and really an important part of the arts community in Seattle and the, and the Pacific Northwest. And that Nia Taro organization, I'd never heard of Nia Taro before investigating and, and researching her work. But Tracy works for Nia Taro, which is this NGO, worldwide NGO, that does work throughout the entire world. And sure enough, within a couple of days of the interview, Tracy was on a plane to some remote island, <laughs> tro- right. tropical nation that I, I can't even remember the name of it. I'd never heard of it before. Was it Manawatu or something like that? Yeah. She, so she is, she's really doing incredible work, reaching out to indigenous peoples uh, throughout the entire world. And um, it's something I appreciated getting to know about her. But one of the things I, I appreciate about these opportunities to interview people like Tracy is that they are in such a separate orbit than you and I. You know, they're just, they're spinning in this completely different universe oh, yeah. of filmmaking. And I would never really be able to just stumble into a conversation with Tracy because that's, that's not my world. Right. But here I am sitting down across the table from her and she gives me an hour of her time to tell me her story, her origin story and how she got where she's at. And now I consider her to be a friend. Right. You know, that's pretty fucking cool. Yeah. And you did a good job. You always do a good job interviewing these, these people. And uh, she opened up to you pretty good. Well, thanks, man. Yeah. It was a lot of fun. Uh, so what will we have next? Guy by the name of Jeff Hamilton. He's a bass player for a couple of different projects. He occasionally does bass work for the Violent Femmes. And he's in a band called Beatallica, which is kind of a spoof band of Metallica styled Beatles songs. Yeah. If you've had the chance to listen to that or want to look that up, it's hilarious to me. I love it. I love it. I love hearing any kind of twist on anything like yeah. that. Yeah. Neat guy. Um, also, slide guitar player. He's a multi-instrumentalist. Oh, okay. Yeah. So yeah. It, it, the, the research that I've done on him shows that he plays bass, but he also plays, you know, six string electric guitar, slide guitar. Uh, he played slide with Uriah Heep. Nice. And uh, played with Sticks, and he's, he's got a lot of band. <laughs> he's got a lot of band projects that really show that this guy is all in right. on music. He's a producer too, right? Yeah. So yeah, he records, yeah. Uh, he produces, he's an audio engineer, he's a road tech, so he's a guitar tech that'll just go on tours. He's a tour manager. Um, he tours the world with his bands too. I mean, he's going to Moscow pretty soon. I think he's going to London and a uh, really neat guy. Just living the dream. Yeah. So um, just like uh, last week's recap, um, let's talk about what we're listening to and watching. You go first. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I just finished a Netflix series with Paul Rudd called Living With Myself. It's about basically two Paul Rudds. There's a, there's a clone uh, that, of Paul Rudd. I won't go into how that happened. But this is ringing a bell. So there's uh, the actual Paul Rudd, and then he gets cloned through a series of um, mishaps. 
And, and it's about the comedy that ensues and the drama that ensues after that happens because he's married. Oh, and no. So, yeah. And uh, what happens with, you know, when, when your clone is actually a better version of you oh, no. than you are. <laughs> that uh, would be my luck. Yeah. So that's a pretty cool little series. Um, another thing I just finished on Netflix is End of the Effing World Season 2, which is one of the most unique series I've ever watched. It's a young couple. They're teenagers, and the male protagonist is, I think, a kind of a budding serial killer. Oh boy! <laughs> yeah, and um, and then the female protagonist is his love interest, who I think is kind of okay with that. You know, kind of okay with that mindset of he's he's a little off. The first season, I won't be, I won't spoil it for anybody who hasn't seen the first season. But the first season was ended with kind of a cliffhanger. And the second season, maybe I've already spoiled it by saying there's a second season, but it's a great, <laughs> it's a really unique show. And the soundtrack is incredible. Right. Yeah. It, it pulls from a lot of folk and blues type of music from the 60s and 70s songs that you, you hear, you're like, that's a really good song. Why have I never heard of that song before? And then you Shazam it and figure out what song it is. And you're like, wait a minute, this is from 1970? <laughs> Why haven't I heard this? Right. You know, because I've listened to folk and blues my whole life. And one song that popped up and I, I shazammed it toward the end of the, the last episode was a song called Then You Can Tell Me Goodbye by Betty Swan. And uh, I, I downloaded it and it's, it's now on my playlist. And I was like, wow, this is really great stuff. Never heard of Betty Swan before. Looked her up. Turns out that she was very talented and successful in the 70s. She stopped performing in, I think, 1980. It just didn't work out for her. She moved to Vegas, became a Jehovah's Witness, and changed her name. Wow. And she's no longer Betty Swan. So, and, you know, the first thing that I thought about when I read her bio was like, I need to interview her. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, it's like, that's a fascinating backstory. It is. But and now she, her her music is being played on a Netflix series, and you know how did that happen? Right, and is she getting a cut of that. Um, some more music that I'm listening to is your brother John told me about this artist named Kurt Vile. Oh yeah, yeah. And I looked him up, and and you know I didn't think it was really. I don't know why I haven't gotten into rock, like modern rock. You know, current rock artists. I'm usually listening to classic. Mm -hmm. You know, older stuff, Rolling Stones and Bob Dylan and The Who, and it's just kind of the, the standards that I've always listened to. Same. And uh, in the newer rock, whether it's the Black Keys or the White Stripes or things like that, you know, it's good music, but I don't gravitate toward it like I do the older stuff. And But I, I listen to Kurt Vile and I'm like, this guy is innovative. Why am I not listening to him? Right. Yeah. So I added him to my playlist and I'm I'm always open to hearing ideas on, on new artists to, to check out. So listeners, if you have any music that you're listening to that you think is, you know, should be part of my playlist, please send me an email or send me a text. Right. What are you listening to? Well, on that note, John has sent me, he always sends me stuff and, and your brother, John, my brother, John sends yeah. me links to stuff all the time. And he recently sent me a couple of songs from Beck's new album, which is really good. I saw Beck at um, the U2 concert that I took Trish to in San Diego a couple years ago. Yeah. He opened for U2. Wow. Yeah. He's good. He's really talented. Very talented. Yeah. He's, what I've loved about Beck from the beginning is he's a multi-instrumentalist, just yeah. like Jeff Hamilton. Right. And he's the type of guy who could just basically have a laptop in his apartment and he'll lay down the drum tracks. He'll lay down the keyboards and the bass and yep. I mean, everything and the vocals, of course. And the, the result is really different, unique, special music. That, yeah. And when you listen to Beck, you're not like, oh, this could be anybody. Mm -hmm. There's only one person that can be. And it's, it's, it's Beck. It's Beck. Yeah. yeah. Now, he was like kind of a pioneer of the digital um, sampling looping movement. Um, you know, uh, the first to use digital software in his own studio to produce his loops and his sampling and getting his beats. And, you know, he was kind of one of the pioneers in the mid to probably early nineties. Yeah. I remember started that. doing that. Mellow Gold was, was of course the song loser. Right. It's like one of his more famous ones. And, and then the Odelay album, this still rings in my 
consciousness as a big part of the 1990s. Yeah. It's, it's neat to see artists that were relevant in the early to mid nineties who are still doing it today. Oh yeah. Still relevant too. I mean, they're not oh, just, yeah. they're not just like playing clubs. They're actually playing stadiums, even if you're just opening, but he's opening for you too. That's I mean, pretty big. Come on. Yeah. yeah that's awesome. He's also, uh, I think a, a fashion icon. <laughs> yeah. His, he's his, unique. Yeah. His, his, uh, yeah, his clothing and just his whole vibe is so unique to him. Right. Yeah. Another thing I just started watching again, and it blew my mind that this is going on again. I don't know if you remember, if you watched a lot of TV back in the 80s. Um, US, That's all I did in the 80s. Okay. USA Network had a show on before MTV was around called Night Flight. Okay, I didn't watch that. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a, you know, it was an edgy kind of show, kind of uh, underground videos, underground cult films. Um, shorts, various things that people made, real druggy kind of uh, psychedelic stuff. And they did a show called New Wave Theater, a guy that, by the name of Peter Ivers, who's no longer with us now, but he hosted a show based out of LA that was called New Wave Theater. And he would go around to these different scenes and interview new wave bands and punk bands. And they would play to have, you know, show them playing a couple of songs and stuff. And it was just really at the time, just cutting edge stuff. Did he interview Blondie and all? You know, I don't, I don't know all the people, but we're talking about yeah. like these bands that no one you would never have heard of if it weren't for New Wave Theater. Yeah. And that show is back on, um, they have a website and they're streaming all of the old night flights. They've got merchandise up I and mean, it's coming back. And so I was blown away to see that. Well, that's, it's always cool to talk to you about what you're listening to and doing and watching because that is something that is, I would never find that on my own ever. Right. You yeah, know, you're you're really looking in some places and some dark corners of of pop culture. Well, I got, actually it was on Instagram. I saw the logo and I'm like, "What is this?" And I just followed it, and I'm finding out that they're back. Like they're you know that show's been dead since probably '85. That's funny. It died about the time MTV got really huge. Yeah, and then it just kind of went away. That's awesome. And now it's back. <laughs> yeah, how's your reel to reel stuff going on Instagram? You know, I still I put a couple more up there, but. You know, I branched out and uh, followed Real to Real on Instagram, and there are hundreds of people doing this. Yeah. So it's, it's really fun to go in and watch other people, what they're listening to. Some of these people have really high quality eight track studio recorders that they're doing weird stuff with, you know? So it's always fun and it's a nice learning process as well, you know? Learning about, you know, different things about tape and these people that are out there are just as geeky as me when they come to finding tapes at yard sales and, just getting all crazy about it. Yeah. It's fun. Yeah. Well, thanks for the recap, brother. You too, man. All right. Hey, thank you for listening. And I hope you enjoyed today's episode of the dream path podcast. If so, I have a favor to ask. Can you go to your favorite podcast service and give me a rating and review? Your feedback is what keeps this podcast going. I appreciate your time. And as always go find your dream path.